Okay, let's try it again, guys. Is the first proton going to be off? 
Okay. Is it going to be here? No. No. Why not? It's half off. It's half off. It's not off yet. It's only half off. Half the molecules have it on, half the molecules have it off. Half of them are salts, half of them are acids, right? Good. Where's it off? What's well, off right here? No buffering region there. So here's where the first proton's off. Which is the first proton that's going to come off? Carboxyl. Why? Lowest pKa. Right? Okay. So, what's the charge of the molecule right here? Okay, this is quick. How'd you, how'd you get there? Because it's Okay, how about the others? Still on the others, right? Every step, I lose a proton. Subtract one. What's the charge here? Plus one. What's the charge here? What's the charge here? Right? You get the idea. Right? You can do a You guys figure this out, right? Okay. Now, the question was, how do I find the PI? How do I find the PI? So the rule was that the whole class was not going to average the PI, right? We had to decide what I was going to do. What am I going to do? Average the two around zero. What's that? Average the two PKAs around the zero. No, I understand that. I'm talking about what am I going to do? Nobody does that. Orange hair. Orange hair. Braided with beads. What's that? Braided with beads. Braided with beads. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those, those big old wooden honking ones. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Heavy beads. Heavy beads. Heavy beads. <laughs> because whenever I see those dudes, I'm like, how do you sleep? <laughs> We should think about this. But then again, you guys have to do something if one person screws it up. So what do you better do? Walk back. You know what? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bless you. I think you should have bought me beer. <laughs> but the other Rangers have to get a little bit of heart. All right, let's get back to this. So um, I need to find the PI. Okay. So I know the PI is going to be somewhere there, right? Everybody knows that. Because the guys with the charge is exactly zero. And I've used my rule to estimate charge, but I know I know where that's going to be. Now I'm going to do the exactly zero part. I'm going to calculate the pH at which is exactly zero. And it turns out that if I average the pKa's on the side of it, I said, what's the pKa here? 8.5. pKa here, 10.5, divided by 2, here's my answer. The answer is 9.5. Okay. You understand how to do that? I'll ask a question. Just determine the charges on the section. How did I do that? Okay. Did you understand how I got this one? Okay. So this guy, okay, so what's the pH then? Okay, so pH 0. If I said pH 0, what's the charges on each of these groups? Because the charge of the whole molecule is going to be some of the charge of all the groups, right? So we have pH of zero. What's the charge? Of, what's the proton on or off? Okay. This way, I have another rule. The rule says pH is more than one unit below. The proton is on. The proton is on. pH zero for this guy. Proton on. pH zero for this guy. Proton on. pH zero for this guy. Proton on. All four protons are on. The means when they have a proton on are plus charge. Carboxyl then puts on our zero charge, add up to plus three. So I start plus three. Right? Okay. I get more than one pH unit above 2.2, I'm going to lose a proton, right? Which one am I going to lose? This guy. Because negative charge. It's still below all the other three. So I've got plus, 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 minus, plus three. Make sense? Yeah, if you go back to the lecture, you'll see I told you what they were. Okay. 
you want to minimize the PKAs, I'm not going to make you do that, but you need to know which ones ionize and how they ionize. Yes, that's, that's your responsibility. You don't need to draw it, but you need to know how they ionize. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you find PKAs? Because you don't know the pH. How do you find the PI if you don't know the pH? Well, the PI, actually, I don't use the pH as an example. So I get, I have to give myself something to start with, so I, I can determine this down here. I made that up. You can you can actually calculate that. Without, okay, so let's say that I didn't I didn't have this here. Okay, I want that up there, and I said, what's the pi of the molecule? How would you do it? Same one, right? I have to decide what the charge is to start, right? So to start, I'm starting with the lowest pH, right? That's why I said one. It would be zero, right? But something had a low pH, but I knew that I had a starting point, and then once I had the starting point, everything else followed. Does that make sense? So I made that up. It wasn't, I wouldn't give you that in the problem. I'd say, here's the PKAs. What's the PI of the molecule? Make sense? Yes? So when you've given us the PKA of the four. Um, how would you calculate the pH? How would I calculate what? The pH. So how would I calculate? I wouldn't calculate the pH. It would depend on salts and acids, right? pH depends on salts and acids, so I'd have to use salt and acid information or something, right? Right. But I'm referring to a question on the practice exam where okay. you gave us five pKs yep. and you asked us to calculate the pH. No, I actually calculate the charge. Oh, okay, gotcha. Right? Yes, so de the pH will determine the charge of the molecule. Right. But you can find the pi without even knowing the pH, just by going through the steps and finding out where it will equal zero. There is no one pH. That's what this graph tells us. All these are pH values, right? That's what the y-axis is. So there's no one pH. The only pH that matters for our purposes is the pi. Right? How, would you, how would you find the pH at which the molecule has a charge of exactly plus two? which is exactly charge plus zero. Does that make sense? So you have to give us a pH to be able to figure out what the charge is, because determining on where the pH is, Absolutely. it'll tell you which one is on and which one is off. This is a, this is a plot of pH, right? Yeah. pH versus OH marks. Yeah. Right? So just, just listen, everything on here is the pH. So if I said, what's the, you know, what's the charge of this molecule, it would have no meaning if I didn't give you a pH, because it would depend on where on this curve that you are. I would have to give you a pH. Make sense? Yes. So this person was wrong. This person needed to know the charge of the molecule. So I gave pHs for that, that problem. I said yeah. the pH1 was oh, the charge of the molecule. Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So if you gave us a pH and told us uh, or asked us how much salt and how much acid is yeah. on one of the two blocks there? Yeah, okay, there's a good one. So let's say, uh, let's go do an acetic acid one. Okay. I'd say estimate. I said give me the ratio. Okay. All right. 
So we say, okay, Henry Schnasselbach says pH. And yes, I'll get the Henry Schnasselbach equation on the exam. It's pKa plus the log plus salt over acid, which is equal to C minus over HAC. Okay. Look at my numbers. Okay. 3 equals 4.76 plus the log of S over A minus 1.76 equals the log of S over A. 10 minus 1.76 equals S over A. That's your answer. So the negative uh, log number means a negative log number, so the negative log would mean the number is less than one. Yeah. So less than one would mean <laughs> the thing just takes a minute. Okay. Make sense? <laughs> Salt are the same so, amounts. 
So if I had 0.2 moles of sodium hydroxide, I'm going to lose um, 0.2 moles of that. I'm going to gain 0.2 moles of that, right? So, so after I've done that, salt will equal 0.6 moles, and acid will equal 0.2 moles. Do you agree? And then I add salt. What is salt? Salt adds to salt. So I have 0.3 moles of salt. Okay, that's easy. I can do that. 0.3 moles of salt. I've got a total now of 0.9, right? Right? 0.6 plus 0.3. I haven't anything to the acid. The acid still sitting there. So now my equation at this point would be pH is equal to pKa, which is 4.76. I'm sorry, it's 5. It's, sorry, I always have to see it, yes. PH is equal to 5 plus the log of 0.9. Oh, my God. 100% right there. Just got 100%. Then the question how much HCl would you have to add to return the solution to its maximum buffering capacity? How do I know I have to add HCl? So I'm trying to get equal amounts of two. And I don't have equal amounts of two. The one I have the most of is salt. So I have to convert salt into acid, right? That's why I need HCl. And the question is, how much? Okay. So 0.7 I will frequently hear. Read wrong. Because the acid is HCl. Strong acid, not weak acid. I'm adding weak acid. If we added weak acid, 0.7 would be correct. But if I add 0.7 moles of HCl, what's going to happen to this? I'm going to it'd be like adding up to hydroxide. It's in the other direction. I'm going to end up with 0.2 moles of this, and I have 0.9 moles of this. So strong acid versus a weak acid are going to do very different things. We're adding a strong acid, HCl. I have to convert this. I had to convert salt into acid. Right. So 0.7 is not correct for HCl. Right. So how much do I add? Well, I know I want to get to maximum buffer capacity, so I know I want those two to be equal, right? How much is equal? Well, how much do I have? How much I have is 0.9 plus 0.2 divided by 2. That would be equal amounts of the two, right? That's what I have now. I have equal amounts. I divide that in half. Which one would be the same, right? Well, you don't have to do that on an exam, but if you want, the answer is 0.55 is when they're equal. You can just leave it as this. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. So the amount of HCl I would have to add would be the difference between the amount that I want to be at and the amount that I actually have. This minus this. Does that make sense? The answer is 0.9 plus 0.2 over 2 minus 2, and the answer to that is actually point three. Okay. Yeah, label your work. I want to give you one piece of advice. Label your work. Everybody wants partial credit. Everybody wants partial credit. But if the TAs can't figure out where you made your mistake, because here you label it and we saw where the mistake was made, you can get partial credit, but if all we see are a set of numbers, we have no idea what those numbers mean, you're not going to get any partial credit. Okay? Word for wise. So label, 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 label. So the more you do that, the more likely you are to have the PA understand what you meant when you were doing that and where you made your error.
talk to you. And I described how a theta cohomology works. Let me just very briefly do that. So I've got, I'm interested in approaching the bias to something like ATV. Okay. So I take my beads, my columns, and instead of attaching an ion or making holes in it or something like that, I attach ATP to it. And these now have all these ATPs sticking out. Right? I take my mixture of proteins, I pour it on the column, and any proteins that bind ATP are going to stick to the beads and hold on to it. Everything else that doesn't bind ATP is going to come through. Right? So the question that she's asking is, how do I get the protein off the column? And the answer I said was, well, add ATP. Why does that work? The reason that works is, remember that we're doing a binding. We're not covalently linking. So this guy is binding the ATP, but it's not making a covalent bond between them, which means that it goes on, comes off, goes on, comes off. So when it comes off, if I've got free ATP, free ATP binds, it doesn't stick to the column. It goes on through. So this coming on and coming off, this coming on and coming off, that will always happen when we have molecules that are binding things that are not covalent bonds. The key to this, if it made a covalent bond, we couldn't get it off. And it's not making a covalent bond, so when I add ATP, it comes off of the B, three ATP binds it, and it just goes shooting through. So there's nothing, there, and now it won't bind anything that's on the piece. Yes, sir? Does the concentration of free ATP have to be more than the concentration of the ATP? Okay, so the question is, does the concentration of the free ATP have to be greater than concentration of beads? It would be better if it was, but it doesn't have to. In fact, if we waited, we ran a lot, a lot, a lot of buffer through it, the protein would eventually come off because it's going to let go, come back on, let go, come on, right? So it'll just take a longer time to do it. So it's a function of, of, of really um, how long we want to Yes?
this might have had a velocity value of, let's say, 3 and a substrate concentration of 0.03, for example. Each one's going to have unique parameters. Right. Well, as I said in class, the disadvantage of this is I see this curve. Do I draw my line here? Do I draw my line here? You saw your book actually drew it in a couple different places relative to where that flattening occurs. So I have to make a guess about where that, where that really is flat. So to simplify that process, instead of doing a V versus S plot, what, will, what researchers will usually do is what's called the line of reverse plot. Plotting plot one over the velocity, that is the reciprocal velocity, versus the reciprocal of the substrate concentration. When they do that, a hyperbolic plot that looks like that, the same data now makes a nice line. That nice line has two really useful points on it. That's the two points identified in the song. Okay? One point is there. That's where it crosses the y-axis. And that point is known as 1 over Vmax. I now have an exact way of calculating Vmax. If this cross occurs at, I don't know, let's say uh, 1 over 20, then that means the Vmax has about 20. The other point that's useful is this guy right here. This is the minus 1 all over km. I get the value of this. I can determine the value of km. That's why a line of root plot is useful, because I can read it directly off of these two points what my values are. So if you take the inverse of a negative number, you're kind of getting still a negative number, right? For the reciprocal, I'm sorry. But I have to take the minus of it also. I want KM, I have to take minus 1. I mean, I have to take minus 1 is minus 1 for KM, right? So this, might, this value might be minus 1 fifth, right? The value of KM would be equal to 5. Minus 1 over minus 1 fifth. Drawing graphs, I mean, I can give you numbers. In fact, if you look in textbooks, you'll frequently see they'll have you plot data to do that. But to me, learning how to plot data is something that you learn in a math 111 class. So I don't think it's as useful for you to plot data plots as it is for you to interpret what plots mean or to predict what happens in the plot. So in general, I'm not going to give you a set of numbers and say plot this because I think that's just kind of wasting your time. But I think the graphs themselves tell you something. This is telling me really useful information. If I gave you this, I would certainly hope you'd be able to tell me how to get the max and how to get the KM. I think that would be really useful. But if I gave you, you know, 20 numbers to plot so that you could find this thing on here, you could spend 15 minutes of the exam doing it. That'd be a waste of time. In reality, you use software to do that anyway. You use software to do that, that's right. Nobody does it by hand anymore. That's exactly right. So it's much more important that you understand what the graphs tell you than it is that you plot that by, I mean, that's just like, they just kind of dumb. Okay, that's a good question. Well, we talked about the reverse point of the issue. Yeah. The non-competitive side, um, because we're uh, dealing with a, uh, the process of having the effect on the amount Yes. And so with a competitive inhibitor, 
not changing the amount of enzyme that can be active, but you're, so that's why it's not changing the Vmax. Okay, so his question is, if I have a uh, competitive inhibitor, I've not really changed the amount of enzyme that's active. That's not quite true. Okay. Because at low concentrations, a lot of enzyme is not active. That's why I have a curve low, if you call it, right? But at very high concentrations, I have essentially none of the enzyme that's active. And it's the very high concentrations that we get next, right? So very high concentrations, and it's a good question, very high concentrations, the inhibitor is like as if it's not there. Concentration of substrate in this guy. Okay? Yes? So if you're to plot uh, non-competitive inhibitors versus competitive inhibitors, with the line, you like a little bit a little bit. If I compare, okay. So he's asking me to give you something I didn't talk about, but I'll do that just since you asked that. So I've got, an, uh, here's an uninhibitor, put a U there, right? Your question is, what does the tender competitive inhibitor look like compared to an uninhibited reaction? Why don't I prefer? You guys can actually do this right now. You're going to help me do it. Right. What do we know about a competitive inhibitor? What changes? AM goes up, right? What happens to the max? It's the same. So we know one point is going to be common between the two, right? For competitive, that's going to go right through that point. What happens to the KM? Well, more negative. Alright? Minus 1 over KM, if the KM goes up, minus 1 over KM will actually get closer to zero. Now I have two points. Two points to find one. Are you there? Right? You do that in the concept. Plug in numbers, didn't do anything like that. You do that in the concept. Right. How about a non competitive inhibitor? What changes? Emax changes. What happens? What about KM? It stays the same. So I know one point's going to be the same. The is going to be the same in two. Vmax is going to go down. What happens to the plot? goes up, it's the reciprocal, folks. One over, right? So, somewhere up here. And that's what it looks like. Make sense? You could have done that. This is why I really like you thinking about what graphs tell you, and you don't get all the the numbers, right? The graphs tell you something. This is really useful stuff. But you could have done this without any number crunch, with anything else, because you knew what happened to Vmax or KM. You simply showed them on a graph that they put that hand. Yeah? I'm sorry, did Vmax go up or down for a number? It goes down. So 1 over Vmax goes up. Okay. Right? The reciprocal.
to the R state to be the band. That's the cooperativity thing, right? Binding one, favors, 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 right? So now as the binding of oxygen occurs, hemoglobin slips, switches into the R state. Okay. And that happens with binding the first oxygen, the first one favors the second one, the second one favors the third one, the third one favors the fourth one, and bang, you've got all four of the oxygen. It goes out to the tissues, it gets out to the tissues, and some, several things affect the affinity hemoglobin has for oxygen. So I talked about protons. I didn't say whether it was R or T. In fact, it's a little fuzzy. So we won't talk about whether protons cause R or T. Protons do favor release of oxygen. So we release some oxygen. Carbon dioxide favors some release of oxygen. But from an R and T perspective, the most important molecule is 2,3 DPG. 2,3 DPG fits in that donut hole of hemoglobin. And that really induces a structural change in hemoglobin. So now it's really going to go into the T state. Okay, the release of oxygen really doesn't want to hold on to it at that point at all. At least it's oxygen. And as a consequence, hemoglobin is empty. 2 3 DPG comes on, goes off, comes on, goes off. Right here's that story again. On the way back to the lungs, it's grabbed by some of the tissues which can use the 2 3 DPG for energy. They grab it, they use it. Hemoglobin is now at the T state, it's going back to the lungs. Does that make sense? In fetal hemoglobin, the donut hole is not big enough for the 2 3 DPG? So that in fetal hemoglobin, the structure is different enough that 2 3 DPG will not bind to it. And so what that means is that hemoglobin in, in the fetus is mostly in the R state. So it's able to take away from R. There's some other minor differences, but that's the, that's the main take home message is it's stuck in the R state more often. So it's very willing to take those oxygens away. Did you tell us how much CO2 uh, hemoglobin can expel? I didn't tell you how many was carried per hemoglobin balance. And that's going to vary a little bit because the, in the case of uh, uh, carbon dioxide, there's several different amino acids that you bind to. So it's binding to a place different than the hemoglobin. That's the bottom line. So, yeah? So wait, uh, hemoglobin is now just two CO2 be on there? So hemoglobin is about two EPG. Can, he, can CO2 be on there? The answer is yes. When you're exercising heavily, though, yeah. those muscles in the ego are good bad. Yeah. Does the core effect overpower that uh, Okay. So this question is, when the butt exercising heavily, do the muscles overpower the 2 3 dpg In fact, the muscles are producing a lot of 2 3 dpg That's a by So 2 3 dpg is a byproduct of rapid metabolism. So these two are working synergistically. That is, 2 3 dpg actually three things, working synergistically. 2 3 BPG is being produced at the muscles, so is carbon dioxide and sore protons. All three of those are favoring the release of oxygen. Yeah? Uh, I thought you mentioned the energy Yeah. Well, it just it gives cells energy. So cells are getting 2 3 BPG along the way. It turns out 2 3 BPG is intermediate in the glycolysis process, the thought process of making that sugar. So it's just like saying, here's another molecule that you can use for food. And so they're grabbing it and using it. Oh, sorry? Sort of like that, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Other questions? I'm sure that this room is empty. We've been running around for a while. Thank you. So the affinity for myoglobin is uh, much less, or no, it's higher for oxygen than yeah. hemoglobin? Yeah, myoglobin's affinity for oxygen is much greater than hemoglobin. Yeah. So when there's absolutely no oxygen from hemoglobin passing by the muscles, would it, it maybe be able to grab some myoglobin? So uh, myoglobin is there, kind of like I described it, it's what I call an oxygen bath. When the oxygen concentration gets really low, then my group will start letting go. And that's useful because if the oxygen levels are really low, you want to be able to have some backup if you can. That's, right. that's really what my group's function is. Are you ready to go? Okay. Um, I will be in my office tomorrow, so if you have questions, come see me. And I will be this video posted quickly tonight. I'll see you guys tomorrow. And good luck on the exam. Ready to go? Um
when you're talking about the uh, how much HCL was added to uh -huh. that one um, solution yep. to bring it back to buffering, yep. uh, it ended up being exactly half of what the uh, weak acid would be. Yep. Is is that something that you expect every single time? Well, I think that you can memorize something like that if you want to, but I think you get confused. Right. Well, but I mean, I'm just, is is that something that is it work that way? I, I'm I'll work through it the entire. Uh, That's fine. 